All right, we're going to go to First Peter chapter um, uh, one. First Peter chapter one this morning. We started here several weeks ago when we were beginning our our series on holiness, and today we are kind of wrapping things up. So we're going to go right back where we started, and today is going to be a little bit different, I think. Um, I'm going to give you kind of a summary. We're going to put all these points that I've been talking about over the last four or five weeks together and give you a quick review and then apply it. Because if we talk about holiness, talk about what it is, talk about how God creates it in us, and then never get to, okay, so what do I do with all this information? Then we're really not helping anybody, okay? So today I want to try to help you understand this concept of holiness again, but what do we do with it? How do we put it into practice? What does it look like in our daily lives, okay? And so we're going to have a lot of scripture today. We're going to have, hopefully, some good application for you. But we're going to start in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 16. This is God's call to holiness for us here in 1 Peter. And it starts, it says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Let's take a minute and pray, and then we'll get into our message this morning. Our Father, God, we just ask for your help now. As we look into your word, there's no way we can understand it or apply it on our own. We need your spirit to help us. And you've told us in your word that as we have your spirit in us, that he will guide us into all truth. He will teach us the things that we need to know. And so we need your help today. Lord, I pray that you would just open our minds and hearts to receive this willingly, joyfully, knowing that you want to change us, that you want to make our lives more in the image of your Son. And so, Lord, do your work, we pray. Lord, fill me with your Spirit. I need your help and I need your power. I need your wisdom to preach the truth, to share these things with us so that they are profitable for us to move forward in our Christian walk. We want to give you the praise during this time, but we want to give you the praise and glory in our lives. So, Lord, make all of this applicable to us today, and we'll give you the glory in all of it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, as an introduction, and I have to apologize. My introduction is like five pages long, but it'll go fast, okay? Um, Because it's really just a summary. What I did was compile the principles that we had talked about over the last four or five weeks. I'm not going to give you all the details because we did that. We just want to get the basic principles here because without those, we're not really going anywhere. So we'll stick with basic principles, okay? So holiness, as we see in 1 Peter 13, it says, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober. It has to do with our thinking. And we saw that holiness begins inside with how we think. If our thinking never changes from what we want or from what we think is right to what God says, holiness will never happen, okay? It starts that process at salvation. We realize that we're sinners. We give up ourselves. We give up trying to serve God by ourselves. We give up trying to be good enough to be saved, and we submit to God's truth. So our thinking changes. We realize, okay, I'm wrong. God's right. And there's the beginning of it. But that process continues to happen. Our thinking has to continue to change according to God's truth. In Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, we like the second part. In all your ways acknowledge him, he shall direct your paths. Yeah, I want God to direct my path. We forget. It says, trust not or lean not on your own understanding. And yet, so many times we fall into that trap where we go, I can figure this out. I know better. Yeah, I've got some truth, so I'll work this through and come to a logical conclusion. Human reasoning will lead you to untruth, not truth. Because so much of God's truth goes against human reasoning. 
Because in our minds, our human thinking is, is programmed, really, through our human nature, which is faulty because of sin, to always look out for ourself, to always come to a conclusion that seems good for me. And so that's where we go. And yet the contrast or the paradox of Christianity, as I call it, is that it's not about me. It's about Christ. It's about God. It's about everybody else. I don't matter anymore. But that's not how our human thinking wants to, to take us. And so coming to a logical conclusion is not always God's truth. We have to trust what God says, period. And it doesn't matter if it makes sense or not. God's word is truth. We have to accept that. So therefore, it becomes the standard for everything. So we ask this question. There's two questions. The first one is this. Does what I'm doing or how I live agree with God's truth? And when I say that, I mean all of it. Now, how many of you know all of the Bible? Somebody want to come up and quote it for me? No? Come on, next week. I'll give you the opportunity next week. I'll give you some time to work on that, okay? I'm not going to quote it. That's why I keep my Bible right here. Because there's many times this old faulty brain of mine knows scripture and I'll start to quote it. And you've heard me do this. I'll start mixing up verses and mixing up words and be like, oh, wait a minute. I got to look to make sure I'm getting it right. Okay? That's what we need to do. Keep going back to make sure we got it right. Don't trust our own understanding. So we ask this question. Does what I'm doing and how I live agree with God's truth? Well, you just admitted, and I'm going to admit, I don't know all of God's truth yet. Is that an excuse not to obey it? No, we have to find out. And so we have to go and study it. We have to read and study it. See, here's the question. Is God's truth as a standard important enough for us to find it out? Or do we just go, eh, I, you know, I, I think I know enough. And I'll wing it. And that's what gets us into trouble. So we have to know what God's truth is. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That means rightly applying it in God's way in our lives. Okay, so we have to study and read. And the only way to find out what God wants us to do is to get in the word and stay in the word and just really immerse ourselves in God's word continually. Now, I've had come people, people come to me all the time, and, and this happens to me. They'll say, well, Pastor, you know, I read through this passage. I'm doing my daily Bible reading, and I started here, and I read this chapter. I got to the end, and I was like, I don't even know what that means. Or I completely didn't pay attention, and I forgot everything I just read. All right. It's called planting seeds. Tomorrow, read the same thing. The next day, read the same thing. And eventually, things are going to start clicking if you're truly looking for God's truth. You don't have to read through the Bible every year to be a good Christian. You have to be learning and growing to be a good Christian. And if you read one chapter of the Bible every day for a year, but learn from it so that your life changes, then that's worth it. Okay? So that's what I'm saying. We have to seriously be students of the Bible. But it's about our attitude. It's not just having the word in and changing our thinking. It's about changing our attitude as well. Now, here's the problem with a lot of Christians. We want to rejoice in the truth. We want to talk about God's love and God's mercy and all God's blessings. And there's nothing wrong with that. That can be very encouraging. But... While we want all the good stuff, we never want to be broken by it. And there's the important part. If we, all we want is the good things and the blessings and the rejoicing and the praise and glory and joy, and, and we never want the repentance from sinfulness and the real evaluation of ourself according to Scripture that we're rotten sinners that deserve nothing, and we have to continually going back to God saying, God, I messed up again. Please forgive me and help me to do better. Okay, that nothing will ever change. We don't really want God's holiness. All we want is to feel good. Let me give you a great example of this because it's called immaturity. In our house, we try to have Bible time after dinner whenever we have dinner together. My grandson is two years old. We were sitting at dinner one night, just got done. And he pipes up. Out of, out of the blue almost, it seemed like. And he says, Papa, get your Bible. Read your Bible. Papa, get your Bible. And I was like, oh, 
my grandson is becoming spiritual. He loves God. Oh, he wants to hear the Bible. You know, this is the pride in you. And so we got the Bible, and I opened my Bible, and I read, okay, Ephesians 6.1, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, that's as far as I got. And Nate bursts out, and he says, Papa, put it away, put it away. <laughs> See, we don't want it to apply to us. We don't want to be guilty and convicted by it. And, and that's us. I mean, that's it right there. God shows us something in Scripture that puts the hook in our heart and says, okay, there's sin here. There's something wrong you need to deal with. And we're like, okay, God, it's time to put it away. I don't want to hear it. But we have to be broken by the Scripture. And we won't ever be broken by the Scripture until we submit ourselves to its authority. Okay, so that's what I mean about our thinking and our attitude. We have to submit to the authority of Scripture. And we have to focus on God's truth. I, I counsel a lot of people. And um, I think some of the things that people struggle with, when people struggle with sin, the thing that deters them the most from overcoming that is that they continue to focus on the sin. Okay, I may have shared this with you. I, I counseled with a man years ago, and he, he was just addicted to pornography. He could not. He was saved. He, had, he, he knew the scripture, he, but he just could not break this habit. And I said, what is wrong? What, what is going? He says, I can't stop thinking about it. He says, I know it's wrong, and I keep thinking to myself, I've got to stop. I've got to stop. I've got to stop. This is bad. This is bad. This is bad. I said, here's your problem. All you're thinking about is the sin. You have to replace the sin with what God says, the truth. And that's where we struggle in our Christian lives. And this is the bottom, the, the base problem of most of our issues in our Christian life. We, instead of focusing on God's truth and looking at that as the solution, we focus on the sin or the problem or the suffering or all the other circumstances. We don't focus on the truth of God. See, if we want to overcome sin, we have to stop focusing on the sin. It may not even be our sin. It could be somebody else's sin. We're so consumed with somebody else's sin. Ah! Okay, that chains us to the sin instead of focusing on the truth. Okay, in 1 Corinthians 13, the Bible says that love rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. We have to focus on God's truth if we're going to have victory, if we're going to grow in our lives. Okay, so it's about our thinking process. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, here it defines what we are to think about. I want you to turn there very quickly. We're not going to spend much time here. But very quickly, I want you to look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. I'll give you a minute to turn there. These are the things that we are to think about, that we are to focus on. This is what God tells us where our focus and our thinking should be. All right, Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That is, he say, here's some of the things you should think about. He says, no, here is the focus of your thinking. And he gives us this list. He says, whatsoever things are true, what things are defined by God's truth, not my truth, not my version of the truth or what I think is truth. We think about God's truth. Then he says, whatsoever things are honest. The word means honorable or worthwhile. He says, whatsoever things are just, that which is right according to God, not according to me. Whatsoever things are pure, that means wholesome or morally clean. Okay? Whatsoever things are lovely, the things that are pleasing and gracious. Whatsoever things are of good report. What would God reward? Not what man acclaims, but what, what does God reward? If there be any virtue, and the word virtue here means not characterized by commonness, but characterized by excellence, the best. And then he says, if there be any praise... What would God praise? What does he uphold as good? And he says, think on these things. There's the guideline for our thinking. But we fill our minds with so much other garbage that keeps us from thinking on this. 
so if our thinking becomes transformed by God's spirit and conformed to his truth, then our life will be defined by Christ's character. Because what you see here is the character of Christ. Okay, we'll see that in just a minute as we get into, into 2 Peter. So, we're to look at everything from God's perspective, according to his truth. And we have to ask that question. Does it conform to God's truth? Is, it, is my life an example of a practice of God's truth? Or does it fit the standard of God's truth? Second, does it accomplish God's purpose? And very quickly, we did this a couple weeks ago. Remember, God's purpose for holiness is threefold. Number one, we're to glorify God in everything. So we have to ask that question. Does my life, not just this activity, but everything we do, does everything in my life give God the glory? Does it reflect his character, his nature? When people see me, do they see God in how I live? That's the, the question. And obviously, we have to answer that all the time. No, not perfectly. That's why we need to continue going back to God and saying, God, I failed again. I need your help. Please make me more like you. So we have to give God the glory in everything. So we ask that. Does it give God the glory? Does it reflect his character? The second one, does it accomplish uh, God's purpose in sanctifying me, bringing me more in the image of Christ? Remember, sanctification was God's process of taking me out of myself and putting in me more of God so that I become in my character more like Christ. And it's not my character. It's Christ's character being reflected in me. Remember, we used the analogy of the moon and the sun, and God is the sun, and we're just a hunk of rock that's reflecting the light of the sun. Okay? That's what sanctification is. Um, I want to share with you 2 Peter chapter 1. If you go there very quickly, it should be close by. 2 Peter chapter 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 10. It's a long passage. I'm not going to spend time here. I just want to explain this process of sanctification very simply according to Scripture. So starting in verse 3 of 2 Peter 1, it says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now I'm going to stop there for two seconds. According to that verse, not a single one of us has an excuse not to be holy. God has given us everything we need to be holy. So we have no excuse. And he goes on. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Look at Jesus Christ. That's what holiness looks like. And we have everything we need to get there. Verse 4, whereby we are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be what? partakers of the divine nature. Remember, God's purpose is to sanctify us, to instill in us the character of Jesus Christ. There it is. We are to be partakers of his nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. More of Christ, less of me. Verse 5, he says, okay, here's the process or the progress that you'll see. And beside this, giving all diligence, that means it's hard work, you're going to have to work at it, put effort into it, add to your faith virtue. And virtue is the quality of life which makes someone stand out as excellent. We just saw that. If there be any virtue, something that's excellent, it makes you different from everybody else because you're more like Christ. So add to your faith virtue. You're different. Add to virtue, knowledge, that means understanding or wisdom, how to use the truth. And to the knowledge, add temperance. If you know how to use the truth, then you will have self-control and moderation. Your life will be different in how you behave. And you won't go to extremes in anything, and you won't be controlled by anything. That's the word moderation, okay? So he says, add to your, your knowledge, temperance, self-control, and to temperance, patience, we talked about patience, long-suffering, and endurance, even through trials. We persevere. And patience, godliness. That means to live reverently, loyally, and obediently toward God. If you want to just put obedience there, that would be perfect. Okay? And to godliness, brotherly kindness. Now, if we are obedient to God, then we will be kind to each other. And the word here is about being useful to each other. Not just, hi, how you doing, have a nice day. It means we are actually useful to each other. We exhort, edify each other. 
And if we can get there, then the final step here is into brotherly kindness, charity. That is the ultimate self-sacrificing love. I will do whatever it takes to help somebody else no matter what it costs me. And I will never look for anything in return. That's what Jesus did for us. So it's a process of sanctification, but it's a process of maturity. And it all has to do with our thinking. And so when we look at this, we ask these questions. Does what I do and how I live cause me to think more of myself or more of God? Does what I do and what I think and how I live cause me to focus on God and what He wants for me? Or does it focus on what I want? And am I doing it because I enjoy it? Or am I doing it because it pleases the Lord? See, we have to answer those questions. And we have to ask those questions about everything we do. Because if we say we're interested in being holy and then we don't evaluate ourselves according to the standard of God's truth, then we're not interested in being holy. So the bottom line is this. Either our choices in life bring me, bring me closer to being like Christ or they demonstrate that I have made myself the idol of my life and I'm not interested in being holy. Now we saw idolatry is the greatest obstacle to holiness and this right here is the greatest idol that we could ever have. Myself. So we have, does it glorify God? Does it sanctify me? And the third one is, does it edify others? Again, we already talked about building each other up, edifying and loving each other. Very quickly, three verses, Romans 14, 19. Let us therefore follow after things which make for peace and things wherewith we may edify one another. That's a command. We are to edify one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. That's an important verse. If you get a hold of that verse and start practicing it, it will change how you treat people. I guarantee it. Because it, it, basically it's saying, I might be allowed to do a whole lot of things in my Christian liberty, but are they helpful to other people? And that's all that matters. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. So in evaluating our life, when we look at the things we do and how we live, we have to ask, what is it doing to build other people up and bring them closer to God? And if it doesn't accomplish that purpose, then should we be doing it? And if you don't care about that answer, then you don't care about God's holiness. Now, there's the review. I want to go quickly through some examples because I told you we have this substance kind of of what holiness is, what God expects, how even God can make us holy. But how do we apply it? Okay? So I'm going to make it real practical for the rest of our time together. We're going to apply this to different areas of our life. I'm going to start with mundane things because in 1 Corinthians 10.31, it says, whether therefore ye, what? Eat or drink. Okay, the most mundane things in life. For some people, it's the main things in life. Okay, but um, it, it's just basically survival. Okay, the Bible says the, body was, the, the food was made for the body, not the body for food. Okay? We shouldn't live to eat. We should eat to live. That's what my dad always told me. And it's a great principle. So let's apply these principles of holiness to our food, how we eat, what we eat. Okay? Here's the first principle. And these are all biblical principles. I'll give you the verses for them. Physical food is not as important as spiritual food. Do you live that way? Physical food is not as important as spiritual food. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 9. Be carried not about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have, profited them that have, which have not profited them which have been occupied therein. The writer of Hebrews basically says you need to focus on spiritual things. Don't get distracted by weird doctrine, by sayings of men, by the wisdom of men. And don't get focused on food which many people have, and it's done them no good. Okay, that was my interpretation of Hebrews 13.9. Spiritual is more important than the physical food. 
Jesus said that in Matthew. Man shall not live by bread alone, right? In, in, um, in his ministry, Jesus, how many times? He, uh, twice, he fed multitudes with just a little bit of food. Okay, once he fed 5,000. The second time he fed 4,000. He started with just a couple pieces of bread and some fish the first time. Second time he just had some bread and everybody got to eat. But the people came back. They followed him across the Sea of Galilee and around to the other side where they knew he was going to be. And he said, you don't want spiritual food. All you want is the physical food. And so we look at our lives and we go, okay, well, I am thankful to God I pray every time I eat. Okay, but is eating more important to you than your spiritual growth? How many times a day do you pray about God helping you to grow in maturity spiritually? We pray three times a day for our food. Do we pray at least that much? for our spiritual growth? See, this is getting practical. This is where the rubber meets the road. Are we concerned about holiness? Here's the second principle. Food should not control me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful unto me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. We should not be controlled by anything except the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 tells us that. Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, okay? Food should not control me. Here's what we have as far as addictions are concerned. Now, if I took a poll, and I won't, most of us would say, I'm not addicted to food. I'm not addicted to anything. How many of you would be able to function without coffee? I'm just asking. Are we more dependent on coffee than we are the Holy Spirit of God? See, this is practical stuff. And if we, we can't get serious about answering those questions, then we're not truly concerned about God's holiness. Proverbs chapter 23, verses 20 through 21. Be not among wine-bibbers, among riotous eaters of the flesh. For the drunkards and the gluttons shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall clothe a man with rags. God warns us about gluttony or about being controlled by food or drink or whatever. Anything that controls us is wrong. And he says, you don't want to be around people who are controlled by something like that. Because they're going to come to ruin and they're going to drag you right down with them. See, these are serious principles. This is what the Bible teaches us. Principle chapter number three for food. Number one, physical food is not as important as spiritual food. Number two, food should not control me. Number three, my eating should not offend others. Now, you can take that a couple different ways. My dad used to say about certain people, I'd rather hear them sing than eat, because I've heard them eat. Okay? Hopefully, no one has to hear you eat. Okay? That's one way you can offend people through your food. But this is a lot deeper than that. Okay, in Romans chapter 14, verse 15, Paul gives this principle in, in this verse. He says, but if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. It means He's basically saying, if you offend your brother with your food or how you eat or what you eat, then you do not love him. He goes on, destroy not him with your meat or your food for whom Christ died. Is what we eat more important than our love for other people? Is where we eat more important than our love for other people? How we eat, of course. Does love supersede what we want as far as food and drink and all of the rest of that? That fits in that category. Now, this is talking about meat offered to idols. Or actually, Paul is referring to people also that banned certain meats because of the Jewish laws. Now, we're in the New Testament here. God had already said to Peter and to Christians, I've given you all this stuff. Enjoy it with Thanksgiving. Eat it all. In fact, he said, all manner of creeping things and four-footed beasts, if you look at Peter's vision. That means insects, bugs. Okay, my brother likes fried grasshoppers. I think he's a little weird. Okay, but hey, God says, I gave it to you for food. Now, if someone is offended because we're allowed by God to eat whatever, and going back to the Jewish law, there were people who pork was off the limits, right? I mean, that was unclean. And there was a big 
problem in the early church with Christians who ate pork. Because the Jews were there going, oh, that's bad, that's bad, you can't eat that. That's sinful. And this is what Paul's addressing here. He's saying whether it's prohibited, whether you're allowed to, what, no matter what you think there, it doesn't matter. The bigger principle is, do you love your brother enough to give up something that you're allowed to do to show that you're concerned about what God's concerned about? If you have to indulge yourself and take part in things that you know offend other people, and this goes way beyond food, but we're looking at it in the context of food here. If you have to claim Christian liberty as your excuse and you don't care how it affects other people, then you failed in the love test. See, that's the bigger principle. And that applies to our food. So this principle of truly loving one another with a sacrificial, selfless love actually is a principle that should control everything we do. Everything. Not just food. If we love God, we will love each other. Now, we talk about holiness, and this is probably one of the biggest principles we can start with. Do I love my brother in how I do this? Or do I consider how the, my partaking or my participation in something or how I do something, how it affects other people? What influence do I have on them through my decisions? See, if we seriously ask that question to ourselves before we do anything, then we're concerned about God's holiness. Because love is a mark of our growth in holiness. One more principle on food. I'm going to throw this one for free. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. The Spirit speaketh expressly that in latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing doctrines and doctrines of devils, false teachers. We're talking about. And you're like, how does that have to do with food? I'll show you. They speak lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. They forbid to marry and command to abstain from certain foods, specifically meat. That's the definition of a false teacher who commands and demands that you only eat certain things in your life. See, that's the other side of it. When we have to force other people to conform to our standard, we're really not concerned about holiness. But the free part here is, it's not a sin to eat meat. And Paul says, false teachers are the ones who are going to go around telling you, it's a sin to eat meat, you shouldn't do it. Okay, or a, a sin to eat certain foods or whatever. So there's lots of biblical principles in Scripture, I just gave you a sampling. When you start reading Scripture, when you start looking at Scripture and really asking God, okay, what are the principles I need to apply in my life, in certain areas of my life, then you start asking these questions. Number one, do I love other people in what I'm choosing? Do I consider them and how, what my influence may be on them? Okay, we can apply this in every area of our life. What about our entertainment? <laughs> Pastor, you're stepping on toes now. I have to apply this to myself. You know, I'm preaching to myself. I say that a lot. Because this is for all of us. Let me ask you this. Is there a biblical principle that gives us the freedom to be entertained? Think about that. If our life is dedicated and set apart, that's the sanctification, to serving God and to giving Him glory, is there allowance in Scripture that we can just turn that off and be entertained for our own pleasure? That's a serious one. I had somebody go, well, 1 Timothy 6.17 says God gives us all things to be enjoyed. So we're just supposed to enjoy God's creation. Got to take it in context. That's the important thing. Because the verse continues and defines enjoyment as being rich in good works and in giving to other people. So see, the enjoyment we get from everything is the blessing of helping others. If we keep it for ourselves. That negates the enjoyment in God's eyes. Here's a principle that you can apply to entertainment. Okay, God gave us a principle of a Sabbath. He gave Israel the Sabbath day, a day of rest. No work. Now, what most people don't realize is that the Sabbath day was not set apart as a worship day. God never commanded Israel to worship necessarily or go to the tabernacle and do the sacrifices and do all this stuff specifically on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a day of rest. 
It wasn't a day of church gathering. It was a day of rest. They stayed home. He said, don't go out and get food. Don't do anything. You rest. So God wants us to have that time to rest. Okay? But then the question is, how much rest do we want? How much distraction do we want? How much entertainment do we want? See, we start, and, and in this comes the principle of stewardship. Okay? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Are we redeeming the time or are we wasting most of our time pleasing ourselves? Now, I'm going through this quickly and I'm just giving you these references and these principles because it's important for us to evaluate everything that we do according to Scripture. So, just simple things. How much time do you spend watching TV per week versus how much time you spend reading your Bible? What's more important to you? Simple question, right? But people don't want to answer that because, oh, yeah, yeah, he's going to accuse me of not being holy and not being interested because I watch more TV than I do reading my Bible. But isn't that a sign of what's important to us? I'm going to give you this example because I thought it was kind of funny. We use the word amusement. Amusement means different thing now than it used to, okay? But if you take the word amusement and break it down, it comes from Latin, two words, ah and muse. Ah means no, muse means think. Get the picture? Okay, so when we want to be amused, don't make me think. Wait a minute, we just read in 1 Peter, he said, gird up the loins of your minds and be sober. We read in Philippians chapter 4, think on these things. See, our mind always has to be engaged. Resting doesn't mean we turn it off. In fact, the best refreshment and rest we can get is fellowshiping with the Lord in His Word and prayer. So we never turn it off and just sit back and do nothing. Okay? That's not rest. We're not given the opportunity for amusement or no thinking. The Bible never says, empty your mind. In fact, if you ever talk to somebody and they present you even a religious uh, uh, practice or, or thinking process where they start with, you need to just empty your mind, that is false. Run. Okay? So the purpose for God's, if you want to call it entertainment, but it's refreshment really, is for our spirit to be refreshed in Him and in fellowship. That's why we gather, one of the reasons. See, this is spiritual refreshment for us. But it's not to just, I want to sit back and do nothing, just leave me alone. Again, does it glorify God? Does it bring me more in the image of Christ? Does it help others? We have to keep asking those questions. Now, if you go to Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, the end of it, talks about what I call the Bible's TV guide. Okay? And you'll see at the end of Romans chapter 1, let's start verse 27. I mean, you turn on the news, you can't even avoid this anymore. He says, Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of their women, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, receiving it in themselves, that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, Wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Look at that list. Now, you don't have to go to Romans chapter 1 to see that list. Just turn the TV on and just look at the guide. Look at the shows that are listed there. 99% of them are right here. Are we being entertained by that? Now, look at the last verse, verse 32. Who, knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They're entertained 
by sin. And God says only people who do that, they're reprobate minds. Are we entertained by sin? Is that what we choose for our entertainment? I mean, you can apply this in lots of areas. I'm going to give you one more and then we're going to finish. Clothing, our dress. Okay, what principles does it have in the Bible? How does it tell us how to dress? Well, there's a few verses specifically, and Peter addresses the woman's adornment. She shouldn't be with fancy apparel and braided hair. Okay, it doesn't mean you can't wear jewelry or fix your hair. It just means that the focus is not on the outward. It's not drawing attention to yourself. But let me give you this. Okay, in Isaiah 58, verses 13 to 14, it says, God is talking to Israel. He says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, thou shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with an heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, that passage about the Sabbath, and you go, what's the Sabbath got to do with how we dress? It's the principle. God says, I'm giving you the Sabbath because this is what I want you to do on that day, because I know it's good for you. And he uses this phrase in verse 14, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. We want what God wants, right? So here, here's a great way to start when we start thinking about how we dress, what clothes we wear. Are we doing what God wants? Well, God never says anything about what we should wear. Uh, well, he does if you want to dig for it. Okay? Let me give you some principles. Okay? Here's God's standard of dress. Let's look at people that God dressed. Starting with Adam and Eve. Okay, God made Adam and Eve's clothing. Remember, they sinned and then they tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. They, they, now, fig leaves were pretty big. Okay, so they're, they got the fig leaves covering the important parts. And when God came, he said, sorry, that doesn't do it. And so he killed animals and he covered them with animal skins. And it says he made them garments. And the word there, if you interpret it from the Hebrew, it's interpreted tunic. It's what we know as a tunic. Now, we think of a shirt as a tunic. Okay, but back in Bible times, and this became the standard for dress all through Bible times, even up through the New Testament, there was a tunic that people wore as the standard dress. And basically what it was was an animal skin or piece of cloth had holes for the neck and the arms. Sometimes it had sleeves. But it went from neck to knees. That's what God gave Adam and Eve, neck to knees. He dressed the high priests. And the high priest started with the tunic, neck to knees. But then he put a coat on top of that that went all the way down to their feet. It was robe. Remember, it had the tassels and the bells so the people would know if he died in the Holy of Holies. Okay? But it covered them. It covered them. So it was a covering Getting the picture here, okay? It's a covering. God dressed the angels. He created the angels. And it talks about the angels. and never says they have robes, but it actually says they have uh, these specific angels are, are six-winged angels. It says with two, they cover their face. Two, they cover their feet. And with two, they do fly. Now, the word fly is in debate because in Hebrew, it can mean many things, this word. The word actually could mean to fly, but it also means to cover so many commentators think when they say two covered their face, two covered their feet, and then two wrapped around them like this to cover their entire being. Why? Because they're in the presence of a holy God. And God says we have to be covered. We're going to look at Revelation 4 hopefully next week. And in the middle of that chapter, it talks about the elders, the four and twenty elders who sit around the throne of God. And they are clothed in white raiments. Covered. Now, I don't have time to get into all the details, but let me give you some great principles. When God gave us clothes, he wanted us to be covered. Okay? That means not defining our body and not revealing our body. 
And so if we wear things that define our body or reveal our body, the things that are important to God, then I think we need to start asking questions. Am I doing it the way God wants it or am I doing it because this is what I like? Now, I know, you know, you say, well, you're getting a little picky here. No, I'm not. But, uh, yes, I am, okay? But God's getting picky. That's the point. How concerned are we with God's holiness in our lives? In everything we do. Okay, I gave you three examples. But this could apply to everything. Are we concerned about God's version of holiness? Enough to look at Scripture... To pray and ask him, God, what do you want me to do as far as my dress is concerned? God, what do you want me to do as far as my music and my entertainment? God, what do you want me to do as far as what I eat and how I eat and where I eat? And 99% of the time, we never bother to ask him. Because we pick out things that we like, that we enjoy, that make me look good. Now, as far as our dress is concerned, I'll give you one more principle. Does it glorify God? Which means, does it attract attention to me or does it attract attention to God? And there's a difference between dressing attractively and dressing to attract attention. Because then we're not glorifying God. Now we could go on and on. I mean, I, I could stand up here and we could go through the Bible and find principles to apply to every area in life. You know, this was a revelation to me. Not the dress and the music and all the specifics. But God revealed to me. And, you know, I, I, I remember praying, Lord, I want to do your will. I want to live the way you want me to live. I, I, some, I just, I don't understand sometimes. I don't know what to do. And this principle, seriously, about glorifying God in everything. Do we ask these questions about everything? Because that shows how serious we are about, about God's holiness. Do we glorify God in it? Does it reflect his nature? Does it bring me closer to God and does it instill in me the character of Jesus Christ? Or does it make me more like the world? Because I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be different. I want to fit in. Consecration and dedication is about being different. That was the whole purpose for the law in Israel, to make them different. And then does it edify other people? Does what I do in everything in my life ever present a stumbling block that could draw somebody else into something that would be sin for them? See, that demonstrates my love for others. So does everything in our lives correspond with a desire for holiness? That's the question. Am I concerned about truly being holy in all manner of conversation? As 1 Peter 3, 1 tells us. And this is where it will show. Now, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. Okay? God made me feel guilty. Because I fail in this all the time. And I find myself... Going to the Lord at night going, man, I forgot about you and this, and I just did this and didn't think about it. I haven't prayed. And this is what holiness is. If we are serious about being holy, then we have to consider all these things. We have to ask these questions. Does it glorify God? Does it sanctify me? Does it edify other people? If it doesn't fit those three things, should we really be doing it? Now, there's the practical. Now, it's up to you what you do with that. I've taken out the Bible. I've given us God's Word. Now, if you're sitting there going, Papa, it's time to put it away. That says something about where you are in your spiritual life. Okay? As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. May you take that and put it into practice. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Okay? That's how we'll grow. That's how this church will grow. 
as individuals get closer to God, show love to each other, edify each other, glorify God in their individual lives, then we're all doing the same stuff. We all will have the same mind. And that brings us together in Christ. You want unity? It's not about having the same clothes. It's not about even singing the same music. It's about thinking the same way and wanting the same things according to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you've given us everything that we need for godliness, for holiness. You've given us a Bible full of things that most of us don't even know half of. And it's daunting to think about how much we don't know and how much we're going to be responsible for because we didn't bother to even look or to even ask you. But Lord, help us to be serious about this business of living as a Christian, of living in holiness as you called us to in every area of our life so that we can be acceptable in your sight. Help us to be that living sacrifice, giving up what we want, what we enjoy, so that you can accomplish your purpose in us. Lord, we love you. We want to love you more. Help us to love you through our obedience. Just empower us to do what's right and guide us in your truth. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.